Welcome back to Student to Stud. In this episode, we'll go over ankle fractures and everything that you should know as a medical student. Here's the basic outline on what we'll cover in this presentation. Time for our first case. How would you read these x-rays? We have two views, AP and lateral, of a right ankle demonstrating a bimalleolar equivalent ankle fracture. We will discuss what this orthopedic jargon means during this lecture, but basically it relays that there's a distal fibular fracture with medial clear space widening. It is important reading x-rays to be as concise as possible. We will give you the tips and tricks on how to convey the necessary information in the least amount of words. This fracture was successfully reduced and splinted in the emergency department. This fracture meets operative indications and was fixed with a lag screw through the distal fibular fracture with a neutralization plate. Now let's discuss the typical presentation for someone who sustains an ankle fracture. Ankle fractures are caused by rotational type injuries. Patients will state that they twisted their ankle or they fell on their ankle. During your physical exam, you will inspect the ankle to look for any deformity, bruising, or swelling. You must evaluate the skin integrity to confirm that the fracture is not open. You will palpate the entire ankle, and like all fractures in orthopedics, you will palpate the joint above and the joint below. In this case, you'll need to palpate the proximal fibula looking for a masonuve type fracture. You will need to specifically palpate the base of the fifth metatarsal looking for a dancer's fracture. Range of motion will be evaluated if the patient can tolerate, but if there is a fracture, the patient likely will be unable to move the ankle much. You need to document the neurovascular status. Do you know the five sensation nerves that you will test? These nerves are the saphenous, the sural, the deep peroneal, the superficial peroneal, and the tibial. The tibial nerve divides into the medial calcaneal branches and the lateral and medial plantar nerves. Here's a pictorial representation of the ankle joint. The distal tibia is known as the tibial plafond. The tibial plafond articulates with the tailored dome. The medial malleolus is the medial flare of the distal tibia. The lateral malleolus is the distal aspect of the fibula. There are several ligaments to the ankle that you should know. There are four medial ligaments to the ankle. These ligaments are known collectively as the deltoid ligaments. They are named after which bones they originate from and which bones they attach to. The deltoid ligaments are the tibio-navicular, the tibio-calcaneal, the anterior tibial tailor, and the posterior tibial tailor ligaments. You can remember that each ligament originates from the tibia and inserts on the medial bones of the foot. In contrast, on the lateral side of the ankle, there are three ligaments, known as the lateral fibular collateral ligaments which originate on the distal fibula. They are the anterior talofibular, the posterior talofibular, and the calcaneofibular ligaments. The syndesmosis will commonly be talked about in regards to ankle sprains and fractures. The syndesmosis is a connection of ligaments between the tibia and fibula. It consists of five structures, the anterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, the inferior transverse tibiofibular ligament, the interosseous ligament, and the interosseous membrane. There are four ways that you can test the integrity of the syndesmosis. The cotton or hook test is when you take a towel clip in the operating room and grab the distal fibula and pull laterally and look for widening of the syndesmosis. Alternatively, you can dorsiflex and externally rotate the ankle while the hip and knee are flexed to 90 degrees. Pain over the syndesmosis or widening would be indicative of a syndesmosis injury. A gravity stress test can be performed to evaluate the syndesmosis as well. To perform the gravity stress test, the foot would hang in an external position off the bed and a mortise radiograph would be taken. Lastly, you can perform the squeeze test, which encompasses squeezing the syndesmosis and evaluating for pain. Let's dive in a little deeper now. How can you evaluate whether or not the fibula is out to length after sustaining a distal fibula fracture? Well, you can use the dime sign, which is an unbroken curve connecting the distal tip of the fibula and the lateral process of the talus. If you're unable to draw an unbroken circle, then your fibula is not out to length. 
The next measurement you should be familiar with is known as the telocrural angle, which is defined as an angle formed by a perpendicular line to the tibial plafond and a line connecting the tips of the malleoli. The normal angle is 83 degrees plus or minus 4 degrees. This angle should be within 2 to 5 degrees of the opposite leg. Do you know what images you should obtain when you suspect an ankle fracture? You need to obtain an AP, a lateral, and a mortise radiograph of the ankle. The mortise view of the ankle is performed with the leg internally rotated 15 to 20 degrees. To test the syndesmosis, you can perform an external stress test or gravity stress test. You will be looking for whether or not there is gapping of the medial clear space. You will test the syndesmosis if there is an isolated fibula fracture. You need to obtain full length tip fib films. You will need to do this to rule out a proximal fibula fracture which would correspond to a Masonuve type fracture. In addition, you can obtain radiographs of the foot to look for other associated injuries, especially fractures of the base of the fifth metatarsal. You can obtain a CT scan if you're unable to define the fracture with plain radiographs or if you're worried about whether or not the articular surface is impacted. Sometimes, injuries to the posterior malleolus can be difficult to see on radiographs so they can be better defined with CT scans. There are two main classifications of ankle fractures. The Weber classification is broken down into three types, A, B, or C. A is defined when the fibular fracture is below the syndesmosis, B is defined when the fibular fracture is at the level of the syndesmosis, and C is when the fibular fracture is above the level of the syndesmosis. The next classification is the Loggy Hansen. There are four main subtypes of ankle fractures that are broken down into specific stages. We will go over each one in detail. The Loggy Hansen is classified based on the foot position and force applied at the time of injury. The first injury pattern we will discuss is the supination external rotation or SER ankle fracture. The first structure that will be disrupted is the ATFL. Next, the distal fibula will be fractured in an oblique fracture pattern oriented from anterior inferior to posterior superior. Next, the PTFL will be disrupted or there will be a posterior malleolus fracture. Lastly, the deltoid ligament will be disrupted or the medial malleolus will be fractured. In a SER injury pattern, the first structures that will be injured are located on the lateral aspect of the ankle. This injury progresses to involve the posterior structures and finally the medial structures of the ankle. The next subtype we will discuss is the supination adduction ankle fracture. The first structure to be involved is a sprain to the talofibular ligament or an avulsion fracture of the distal fibula. There will then be a vertical medial malleolus fracture or an impaction of the anterior medial distal tibia. The third subtype we will discuss is the pronation external rotation injury pattern. The first structure that will be injured is the medial malleolus or the deltoid ligament and then the ATFL ligament. Next, the distal fibula will be fractured above the level of the syndesmosis in a bleak pattern oriented anterior superior to posterior inferiorly. Lastly, the PTFL or posterior malleolus will be fractured. The last subtype to the Loggy Hansen is the pronation abduction ankle fracture. The first structure that will be injured is the medial malleolus or deltoid ligament followed by the ATFL and lastly, a transverse comminuted fracture of the fibula above the level of the syndesmosis. You are probably thinking to yourself that there is no way you'll be able to remember each subtype in the various stages. The most beneficial way for you to remember each subtype is to learn the characteristics that make each subtype unique from one another. Using the Weber classification, there is only one Loggy Hansen ankle fracture located in zone A. This is the supination adduction ankle fracture, which involves the distal fibula below the level of the syndesmosis. There is one subtype to the Loggy Hansen classification where the fibula fracture is located in zone B. Supination external rotations have a distal fibula fracture at the level of syndesmosis oriented anterior inferior to posterior and superior. It is important to remember that SER injury patterns have the fibula fracture oriented from anterior inferior to posterior superior. 
There are two subtypes the Loggy Hansen classification that have their distal fibula fracture in zone C of the Weber classification. These are both the pronation type injuries. What makes the pronation external rotation subtype unique is the fracture orientation of the fibula as it goes from anterior superior to posterior inferior. Lastly, the pronation abduction type injury has a comminuted fibula fracture above the level of the syndesmosis. If you were asked to classify the ankle fracture on rotations and you have no idea, you have the best chance of being correct by saying that the fracture is an SER type injury as this injury is the most common subtype. There are three surgical tolerances that you should know. The tibiofibular overlap is measured one centimeter proximal to the tibio plafond. It is the overlap seen on radiograph of the tibia and fibula. Normally, there is greater than 6 millimeters on an AP and greater than 1 millimeter on the mortise view. The medial clear space is defined as the space between the medial talus and the medial malleolus. This distance should be less than 4 millimeters. The tibiofibular clear space is the last measurement you should be familiar with. This is normally less than 6 millimeters on both AP and mortise radiographs. Ankle fractures can be treated non-operatively in certain cases. If there is an isolated medial malleolar fracture that is non-displaced or evolved, you can treat this conservatively. An isolated lateral malleolus fracture that's displaced less than 3 millimeters with no tailor shift can be treated conservatively as well. If you have an isolated posterior malleolus fracture that is less than 25% of the joint, or if it's less than 2 millimeters of a step off, you can treat this injury conservatively. There are many operative indications to treat ankle fractures. If there's any tailored displacement, you may be asked while on rotations how much displacement to the talus causes 42% decrease in the tibial tailor contact area. The answer to this question is 1 millimeter. If the tibial tailor joint is displaced, you are at risk of developing rapid and severe arthritic changes. Other operative indications are if there's a displaced medial malleolus, a displaced lateral malleolus greater than 3 millimeters, a posterior malleolus fracture that involves greater than 25% of the joint, or if the posterior malleolus has greater than 2 millimeter step off. Bimalleolar or trimalleolar ankle fractures require surgical intervention. In our first case, we discussed an example of a bimalleolar equivalent ankle fracture. Bimalleolar equivalent ankle fractures are defined as a fracture of the lateral malleolus and injury to the deltoid ligament of the medial ankle. A rare type of ankle injury is known as the Bosworth fracture dislocation in which the proximal aspect of the distal fibula is trapped behind the tibia and is irreducible. Lastly, if the ankle fracture is open, it requires surgical intervention. What are the different surgical constructs that can be used to fix ankle fractures? We will go over the basics, but please realize that there are many different ways to fix these fractures. Medial malleolus fractures can be fixed with a lag screw. If there's a vertical medial malleolus fracture, then you can use an anti-glide plate with lag screws. Lateral malleolus fractures can be treated with a lag screw with a neutralization plate. If the fibula fracture is highly comminuted, you can use a bridge plate. In addition, you can use an anti-glide plate which is placed posteriorly. You need to be careful when placing your anti-glide plate posteriorly as if you place the plate too distally, it can cause perineal tendon irritation. The posterior malleolus fracture can be fixed with a lag screw or anti-glide plate. So if you have an injury to the syndesmosis which requires fixation, you can fix the syndesmosis with a screw or suture button. When you use a screw, you want to place the screw parallel to the joint line, 4 cm proximal, and direct the screw posteriorly to anteriorly. When obtaining your history from the patient who sustains an ankle fracture, it is important to ask if they are diabetic. Diabetic patients require enhanced fixation. Diabetic patients should also be immobilized twice as long as normal. There are four surgical approaches to fixing ankle fractures. The most common approaches that you will see are the lateral and medial approach. We'll start with the medial approach, which addresses the medial malleolus. This dissection is between the tibialis anterior and the tibialis posterior. 
During your dissection, you need to be careful about the long saphenous vein and saphenous nerve. Next, the lateral approach will address the fibula fracture, and the dissection will be between the peroneal brevis and the peroneal tertius muscles. When placing your fibula plate, you need to be aware of the superficial peroneal nerve, which is estimated to be 12 centimeters proximal to the joint line. The sural nerve is at risk posteriorly. The superficial peroneal nerve is anterior to your surgical dissection or in line with your surgical plane. The posterior medial approach has the surgical dissection between the flexor hollicis longus and the flexor digitorum longus. You need to be aware of the neurovascular structures in this area. The last surgical approach we will discuss is the posterior lateral approach. The dissection is between the peroneal longus and the flexor hollicis longus. I would recommend spending some time on this slide to try to visualize each surgical dissection. We will end our discussion with one more practice case. How would you read these x-rays? We have two views, AP and lateral, of the right ankle demonstrating an open trimalleolar ankle fracture with 100% displacement laterally. The patient was given antibiotics and the patient's tetanus was updated. You head down to the emergency department and see that the wound is open with a 5 centimeter medial wound. You irrigate the wound with 6 liters of normal saline and then reduce the ankle. You apply a dressing to the wound and splint the ankle appropriately. You inform the patient that this injury needs operative fixation and consent the patient for X-fix versus internal fixation with possible wound vac placement. A CT scan was performed which further defined the fracture and helped with surgical planning. This injury was able to be definitively fixed. We will finish our discussion with some PIMP questions. Question 1. What angle should you place the drill when placing a syndesmotic screw? Parallel to the joint line and angled posterior to anterior. Question 2. What structures are we concerned with in our lateral approach to the ankle? The superficial peroneal nerve found 10 to 12 centimeters superior to the distal fibula and the short saphenous vein in the sural nerve. What structures are we concerned with in our medial approach? The long saphenous vein. Question 4. Why do we get a CT scan in a complex ankle fracture? We obtain a CT to determine the amount of articular involvement. Question 5. You suspect a pilon rather than a simple ankle fracture. Should you get a CT scan right away? No, you want to place them in an external fixator and then get a CT scan so you can take the fracture out to length and help delineate the fracture pattern. Question 6. What are the values for these radiographic findings? The tib-fib overlap, the tib-fib clear space, and the medial clear space. The overlap is greater than 6 millimeters on AP or greater than 1 millimeter on the mortise view. The tibiofibular clear space is less than 6 millimeters and the medial clear space is less than 4 millimeters. You are attempting to reduce an ankle fracture and you are meeting resistance with soft tissue endpoint. What is the cause? This is caused by entrapment of the tibialis posterior. Where do you place your needle for a joint block to the ankle? You need to place your needle medial to the tibialis anterior and lateral to the anterior aspect of the medial malleolus. Question 9. What are the ligaments that make up the syndesmosis? These are the PITFL, the AITFL, the ITFL, the interosseous ligament, and the interosseous membrane. What is the most common Weber pattern? Type B. What Weber pattern is associated with a syndesmotic injury? Weber type C. What are the indications to fix a posterior malleolus? 25% intraarticular or 2 mm step off. What is the indication to fix an isolated lateral malleolus? Greater than 3 mm of displacement. 1 mm of Taylor shift causes how much decrease in the tibial Taylor contact area? 42%. How far above the joint should you place your syndesmotic screws? 2 to 4 centimeters. And that's all for ankle fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.